Palestine to Yemen to Syria to Iraq. And we're seeing an increased amount of, of fundamentalist violence uh, being exercised outside of the Middle East and being uh, conducted even in our in our Western nations. Most recently, of course, uh, the, the tragedy in New York uh, of a couple days ago. But uh, one terrorist organization with, uh, with an extremely long reach and who has used extremely violent tactics is, of course, the Islamic State. So I want to talk a little bit about where the Islamic State comes from. And in doing so, we really have to address four major themes. We have to understand the longstanding ethnic, uh, ethno-religious tensions that characterize much of the Middle East. We have to evaluate uh, the role that the U.S. invasion and subsequent withdrawal of uh, troops from Iraq uh, had on the rise of the Islamic State. We have to look at the continuing corruption and incompetence of the Iraqi uh, government. And we really have to focus on the role of an increasingly powerful Iran within the, uh, within the region. So I'm going to try and switch slides, and hopefully that will happen. Any slide change? Um, well, we'll see. So when we start to analyze the, uh, the Islamic State, we first have to really ask, well, what is it? And so I want to give a brief summation of what is the Islamic State, what are their goals, etc. So in short, the Islamic State is a Sunni extremist group with the stated purpose of establishing an Islamic caliphate throughout the Middle East. Okay? And so when we're talking about a caliphate, what we're really talking about is the creation of a state. And a state is a geographic area controlled by Islamic State, the centralized authority, is going to be the supreme religious and political leader. So in many Western democracies, there's a, uh, a significant separation of church and state. In an Islamic caliphate, that is not the case. The state is the religion. The religion is the state. And really what the Islamic State is doing is they're, they're uh, trying to adopt a revisionist ideology. They're trying to return to a previous era of, uh, of great glory for, uh, for Islam. So, of course, if this state emerges, and some will argue that it already has, uh, we will not find those institutions that we've come to recognize in our Western democracies. You know, the institutions of an Islamic caliphate, they're going to be derived by uh, some form of Islamic law, and they're going to be... One moment, please. I, uh, Dr. Squires had a valid point here. Okay, hopefully. You, Dr. Arsenal, uh, when you clicked on those individual slides, it did uh, change. So I didn't see, notice that. All right, let me uh, let me try again here. I have a couple different screens going on here. Again, uh, our apologies. This is the the first time we've tried to do this speaker series. That look. Uh, oh, oh, okay. Here we go. We'll try this. Um, so the, the Islamic Caliphate is really uh, adopting this revisionist ideology of trying to return to a, to a point in history where uh, Islam was one of the great civilizations, um, you know, uh, an era of past glory, etc. Um, now, the current caliph or the, uh, the successor for, uh, to Muhammad who's, who's currently controlling this organization is Abu Bakr. El Baghdadi and Al Baghdadi means nothing more than of Baghdad. Uh, you know, it's a nom de guerre, uh, an alias. And the history of Al Baghdadi really remains pretty cloudy. 
Uh, but what we do know is that al-Baghdadi comes from a deeply religious family, a Sunni family. Um, he reportedly holds a PhD in uh, Islamic studies from uh, Baghdad University, which prior to the invasion was still a, a very strong, reputable um, institution. Uh, and most importantly, what we know is that al-Baghdadi, along with many Iraqi Muslims, became increasingly fundamentalist following the U.S. invasion of Iraq. And it wasn't until uh, 2003 or so that al-Baghdadi even became um, notable in U.S. intelligence reports. And we have to remember, this is 14 years ago. You know, we're, we're still dealing with the Islamic State in 2017. 14 years ago, we start to see the emergence of this organization. So shortly after the invasion of Iraq, al-Baghdadi began to form a Sunni militant group, which was designed to combat U.S. forces and, and foreign contractors, and probably more importantly, the secular Iraqi government that was emerging at that point in time. And if we remember, we started to see a really strong increase in the, uh, the insurgency in Iraq. And al-Baghdadi's organization began to merge with other insurgent groups, and they ultimately form al-Qaeda in Iraq, okay? Uh, it's often called AQI. And this is the organization that is the precursor to the Islamic State. So even as early as 2003, we start to see the, uh, the beginnings or the emergence of al-Qaeda in Iraq. And so throughout the Iraq War, the, the U.S. forces conducted a number of counter-terror operations. Counter-terror operations, uh, I guess to put it in a nutshell, is uh, uh, killing bad guys. And so through these counter-terror operations, a number of al-Qaeda in Iraq, AQI, precursor to the Islamic State, they're killed. And out of all these killings, al-Baghdadi uh, came to command uh, al-Qaeda in Iraq in 2010. And he remains in, uh, in command of AQI, the precursor to uh, the Islamic State, from uh, you know, up to the present day. Um, so 2011, the U.S. forces withdraw from Iraq, and we see a tremendous amount of power struggle emerge. Well, a lot of this was placed, or replaced by Islamic fundamentalism, right? We start to see uh, the Islamic State emerge from uh, Syria back into uh, back into Iraq. Okay, so that's kind of where uh, the Islamic State emerges. But I want to start talking about the causal variables that led to the Islamic State. So what we really need to ask is where does the Islamic State come from? You know, it's a difficult question to answer because. Uh, the scope of inquiry could, could go back from the, the, the ancient times of uh, Islamic caliphates, etc. But for, for me, when we're looking at a specific organization, we need to really focus on when did the Islamic State emerge. And that point in time is with the U.S. invasion of Iraq. So uh, the, uh, you know, the U.S. invasion of Iraq, which was a failed foreign policy, we'll get into that later, but it did indeed lead to the rise of this, this fundamentalist Islamic group. That being said, we need to think about five key turning points that, uh, that led to the rise of the Islamic State. First, we need to recognize the deep-seated ethnic and religious tensions that were underlying the Iraqi state for, for, for many, many years. However, it was the U.S. invasion and the toppling of the Saddam Hussein regime that really uh, was a catalyst for the ethnic, uh, ethno-religious violence that, uh, that occurred throughout the region and really sparked um, the, the influence of the Islamic State throughout, throughout the region. Second, we, and kind of building on our first point, we have to trace back the rise of the Islamic State to uh, the failure of the United States government to integrate, you know, equitably integrate, all conflicting ethno-religious groups uh, within Iraq into the emerging political system. There was a, a great deal of deep, 
deep-seated animosity that we just didn't uh, we didn't recognize or we didn't um, we didn't address. Uh, now, most notably, the U.S. alienated Sunnis from participating in the Iraqi interim government and later the Iraqi transitional government. Okay, so we have Sunnis, Shias, and, and Kurds, which we'll talk about in a minute. But we alienated a, 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 a large group of the population from the political process, and subsequently we got a tremendous amount of, of pushback. Right, The Sunnis felt alienated. We start to see the emergence of extremist groups. Probably the most powerful is that Al-Qaeda in Iraq, which was the pre uh, precursor to the Islamic State. And we see a tremendous pushback against that Shia-dominated state. You know, we also, uh, you know, even though we made significant gains to combat uh, Sunni extremism, Uh, largely through uh, recruitment of moderate Sunni leaders, and we're going to get into the details of this momentarily. We'll just kind of get an overview. We ultimately abandoned many of our allies. So we have abandoned Sunni, uh, moderate Sunni leaders. We abandoned uh, Kurdish leaders in the north, and we allowed this uh, Shia-dominated government to essentially take over the state, alienate these different groups, and uh, ultimately foster an environment that was uh, conducive to the growing of extremist groups, particularly the, Islam, uh, the Islamic State. Uh, lastly, the invasion of Iraq, it created instability within the broader region, right? It culminates in the Arab Spring, which on paper was supposed to be a, uh, a series or a succession of democratic revolutions throughout the region. But however, what it did is it creates power vacuums and it subsequently created uh, an environment that allowed extremism to flourish and grow. It provided a certain level of safety. Okay, so that's in a nutshell where the, uh, the Islamic State comes from, what it does, etc. But now let's get down into the details of, of that, those different uh, uh, facets here. So as we begin to analyze the origins of the Islamic State, we first need to really recognize the ethnic cleavages within Iraq, um, but they also are ethnic cleavages that characterize a number of Middle East states. So in Iraq, we tend to have three often competing uh, socio-ethnic uh, identities. Um, we have the Shia, which is the dominant group, and it composes about 60% of the population, and it's generally concentrated in the southeast uh, part of Iraq. And the southeast part of Iraq borders uh, and has close um, shared historical ancestry, et cetera, ties with Iran, and that will play a, a significant role uh, later in our discussion. So we also have the Sunnis, which are about 20% of the population. They occupy central uh central and western iraq and we have the kurds which are a non-arab population but of sunni religious uh background that occupy much of northern northern iraq now in terms of in terms of political power uh the sunnis dominated major military and political positions from about 1979 until the U.S. invasion of 2003. Um, I had some, uh, sorry, I, I missed the, uh, the comment from, from someone. My apologies. Um, so the Sunnis may maintain the vast majority of political power from 79 to 2003, okay? Now this, of course, corresponds to the rule of uh, Saddam Hussein, who was Sunni, and uh, maintained uh, his Sunni-backed Ba'athist party also dominated the government. So what do we see here? We see 20% of the population maintaining 100% of the uh, political power within the region. So let's talk about how this relationship works with this Sunni minority 
against the Kurds and the and the Shia groups. So Um, my apologies for the slide projection again. I, uh, I had not run through this previously. Um, anyway, uh, so we start to see political dominate, uh, domination from the Sunni regime, the Saddam backed, uh, regime. When Saddam is in power, he creates a, a, a tremendous amount of repression for both Sunnis, excuse me, Shia and I do appreciate the help. I have my, my notes on one side and the PowerPoints on the other. And when I do, um, um, anyway, under the under the Saddam Hussein regime, we start to see uh, a tremendous amount of repression against the Sunni, the Shia, or excuse me, the Shia and the Kurd. Um, the Shia at best of times were just completely alienated from the political process. Okay. Uh, at the worst of times, they are set up for wholesale slaughter at the hands of the Iraqi government. So most notably during the Iran Iraq war, uh, in the 1980s, we see Saddam crack down on, uh, Shia groups as well as following the Persian Gulf war in the 19, uh, 90, 1991. Same thing happens with the Kurds. So uh, Kurds occupy northern Iraq, parts of Turkey, Syria, Iran, etc. And they face a tremendous amount of repression under, again, a Sunni-dominated Saddam regime. So most notably, we have the, the incident at uh, Halabja in 1998, when the Iraqi government gasses over 5,000 men, women, and children in, uh, in Kurdistan. Okay, so what does all this mean? It means that for 25 years, Iraq is an ethnic powder keg, you know, and, and for those years, the ethnic conflict was prevented uh, only through the Sunni-dominated, authoritarian, repressive uh, Saddam Hussein regime. You know, so we have this long-standing, deep-rooted hatred between these ethnic groups, and when the United States invades and forces the, the Iraqi regime to collapse, we're left with a uh, uh, essentially a power vacuum where we have these three factions fighting for some sort of control. So in 2003, hopefully this will come up. So in 2003, uh, the United States topples that Sunni-dominated government. And now, in one of my, uh, in my opinion, one of the biggest mistakes that we made, uh, you know, through the, the the coalition provisional authority was implementing a policy called debathification. So this concept of debathification really stems from uh, post-World War II policies, particularly denazification. Okay, so in World War II, anyone who had any affiliation with the, the Nazi regime is essentially stripped of any power that they have. They can't maintain a, a, a job, uh, nothing. And we did the same thing in Iraq with Ba'ath Party members, which were, again, uh, associated with the Saddam Hussein regime. 
Now this leads to a tremendous amount of problems. Main problem is any professional that's working in the Iraqi political or economic sphere, I'm talking lawyers, doctors, uh, members of the military, educators, teachers, civil servants, or whatever, was required to be a Ba'ath Party member. So let's think about what this does to your, your uh, country if we decide that everyone will lose their job who has an association with the Ba'ath Party. So all educators are fired, from professors to kindergarten teachers. They're gone. Nearly all public servants from uh, bureaucrats, technocrats, they're all fired. And most problematic is the fact that we fire over 500,000 members of the military, stemming from the lowest in rank, uh, enlisted ranks to general officers. This is problematic, okay? And there's uh, two main externalities that uh, uh, result from debathification. First, the Sunnis, for all intents and purposes, are completely removed from the uh, Iraqi political process. They're also removed from any uh, involvement in Iraqi civil society. So that can be problematic. Second, the removal of Sunni Iraqis from government and other leadership positions leads to a massive influx of Shia into those positions of power. Now, Shia have been oppressed for over 25 years, and they are looking for some payback. So you're already seeing the seeds being planted for uh, a really potential um, violent situation. Okay. So this political situation continues to grow worse. Uh, we start to see a tremendous amount of violence emerge between the Sunni and Shia factions. Uh, the Iraqi government largely supports, remember this is a new Shia, uh, Shia government, supports militias and death squads that target Sunni Iraqis. Now, the real, uh, it really didn't hit rock bottom until we saw this election of Nuri al-Maliki to prime minister and I believe... Uh, 2006. So Nuri al-Maliki was a Shia dissident, so again, backing the Shia parties and the Shia uh, ethno-religious cleavages. He's a dissident under Saddam Hussein from the 70s until he left um, under penalty of death, in which he lived in exile for uh, 25, uh, 25 years, um, trying to support some sort of shadow uh, Iraqi Shia opposition. So he largely operates out of Iran and Syria. Okay? So is he the best uh, actor to try and minimize this era of ethnic strife, being a diehard Shia operating within Iran, trying to overthrow the regime? Well, probably not. You know, Sunni al-Maliki uh, al is blatantly anti-Sunni. He uh, launches a campaign of repression for uh, any Sunni opposition political leaders. He fails to share any of the oil wealth in Iraq with the, with the other ethnic groups. Um, and these actions really began to anger the Sunni minority. And we start to see the Sunnis emerge in armed resistance. So what we see is a Tremendous increase in deaths in Iraq uh, with the election of Nuri al-Maliki. So right here, Nuri al-Maliki is uh, elected. Boom, we see a spike in civilian deaths. So we're looking at, uh, this is by month. So 32,000, or excuse me, 3,200 killed, etc. Throughout this early years of the, the Maliki regime. Now, is Nuri al-Maliki the end-all, be-all for this big spike in death? Well, no, but, um, you know, deaths doubled in six months. And this suggests that uh, at least ethnic uh, war is increasing under the Maliki uh, regime. 
So it's within this uh, this environment of political alienation and increasing ethnic violence that we start to see that precursor to the Islamic State emerge. And again, that's AQI, the Islamic State. Okay, so what we saw uh, was a large sort of fractionalized uh, number of organizations, uh, Sunni organizations, Sunni insurgent groups operating against U.S. forces in the Iraqi government. Uh, over time, they all start to coalesce under one umbrella, and that is this al-Qaeda in uh, Iraq, led by Abu Musab al-Zarqawi, who was a Jordanian uh, extremist who was initially tied uh, closely with uh, uh, al-Qaeda organization, most, most famously headed by uh, Osama bin Laden. And the goals of the uh, al-Qaeda in Iraq are similar to those um, of the Islamic State. You know, AQI seeks to establish an Islamic caliphate. They seek to spread war to Iraq's secular neighbors, most notably the Assad regime in Syria. They seek to engage in a broader war with Israel it's, uh, and what have you. So what's interesting to note is that in 2006, this al-Qaeda in Iraq retained a strong association with that broader Al-Qaeda organization. However, this relationship wasn't to last. So under Zarqawi, uh, pictured here, um, he launches a systematic assault, not only on U.S. forces, not only on the Iraqi government, but he also launches a tremendous and violent ethnic war against Shia Muslims as well. Uh, AQI launches a number of suicide attacks, car bombing uh, attacks. They round up and summarily execute Shia civilians. There's public torture, and probably most uh, famously, we begin to see the beheadings. So the beheadings are not new. They're not just Islamic State. They, we can trace them back to, to the early 2000s as well. However, all this wholesale violence against fellow Muslims, in this case the Shia Muslims, we start to see a very strong pushback uh, by the broader Muslim community, right? Uh, public torture, et cetera, it's not going well. You know, even Al-Qaeda starts to realize that AQI has gone too far. So for Al-Qaeda, uh, Al killing soldiers is fine. Uh, killing... Um, Contractors is fine. Killing uh, Iraqi government officials is okay. But you really can't start killing fellow Muslims. So we start to see al-Qaeda uh, start to distance itself from AQI uh, in Iraq. So AQI at this time is continuing to plunge Iraq into a really nasty civil war. So let's take a look here. But what are we going to do about this? Well, at the height of the uh, sectarian violence, U.S. forces led by uh, General Petraeus, General David Petraeus, they decided that we need to drastically increase the, the number of U.S. forces in Iraq in order to try and stem this free fall into just uh, total total chaos. And, you know, this, this measure was... Uh, to a point successful. Now one of the most uh, uh, important or successful strategies against Al-Qaeda in Iraq, again that precursor to um, uh, the Islamic State, was to uh, train and equip uh, moderate Sunni leaders in Western Iraq to combat AQI uh, in Western Iraq. So what's interesting is the people that we decided to ally with and, and dump tremendous amounts of weapons, training, uh, money, are the same people that killed U.S. soldiers in Fallujah and Ramadi, etc. But even these people thought Al-Qaeda uh, Al in Iraq, precursor to the Islamic State, uh, was dangerous, problematic, and had to be stopped. So we start to see this serious decline in uh, in deaths in Iraq, uh, largely due to what came to be known as the surge. So although 
the Sunni awakening. Um, sorry. Uh, although the Sunni awakening and the U.S. troop surge really weakened uh, Sunni extremist groups, they weren't destroyed. If anything, these really die-hard extremist groups went more underground in Iraq, uh, and they also found sanctuary across the border in Syria. And here they sit from 2010 to 2011. But we begin to see the rise of the Arab Spring. So Arab Spring, right, tacitly it's a series of democratic revolutions across the, uh, the Middle East and North Africa. Uh, many people frustrated with an authoritarian rule start um, demonstrations against the existing regime, and we start to see either A, democratic revolutions, or B, uh, regimes start to uh, severely crack down on demonstrators. At the very least, chaos starts to really spread out across uh, the Middle East. Now, a particular note when we're talking about the Islamic State has to do with the civil war in Syria. So Syria is long dominated by a repressive regime uh, controlled by the Shia minority. And at first, this civil war emerging out of the, uh, the Arab Spring was characterized by two competing factions. We have a Shia-dominated Assad regime, and we have a semi-unified opposition. However, this semi-unified opposition did not last very long. We saw a fractionalization of the opposition. We had fundamentalist groups. We had uh, Sunni and Shia divisions. We had secular versus religious uh, factions, etc. Now, one of the strongest opposition groups to emerge was what became now known as the Islamic State. These were the hardcore cadre emerging out of that Al-Qaeda in Iraq, who had gained a tremendous amount of experience um, fighting U.S. forces and Iraqi government forces uh, during our war there. And they took those skills and that training and that hardness into Syria. So they really began to make significant political, uh, political gains. And what this political gains did is it really allowed uh, – the Iraqi, or excuse me, the Islamic State to make a, a significant push into um, oh, Western Iraq. And this is kind of where we're at now. The Islamic State makes a significant push into Western Iraq. They essentially uh, drive the Islamic force, or excuse me, the Iraqi government forces back into Baghdad. Uh, they take territory from the Kurds. Um, and there's a number of uh, reasons why that's so, but I understand we're, we're, we're short on time. Um, but at the very least, I, I hope that kind of gave a, a brief background of uh, where the Islamic State comes from. And I'd like to open up to questions and see uh, what we can do to discuss the, the, the current problem with the Islamic State, particularly in, uh, in the West, including the United States, Europe, etc. So... I will definitely open it up for uh, for questions if that's okay with Dr. Spires. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Arsenal. You mentioned there at the end about the Islamic State attacking Kurdistan. I was actually in Erbil teaching at the University of Kurdistan when that happened, and it caught a lot of people off guard. I was uh, about an hour and 15 minute drive from Mosul when they overthrew Mosul and no one expected that. And uh, that's actually just shortly after that when they tried to attack Erbil, which is the capital of the autonomous Kurdistan region, that's when the U.S. intervened again. And uh, in our most recent campaign there in Iraq, I got a question from a student. They read your profile about you being in Iraq and wanted to know if you could talk a little bit about what a civilian intelligence analyst is and maybe you could speak a little bit about your experience during that time. Sure. Um, so part of what the Army was trying to do was to take people outside of Army intelligence. Army intelligence officers are trained to think one particular way. Academics are generally trained to think in a different way. 
So the idea was if you can have two different ways of thinking about uh, these, these military problems, you're more likely to come up with an effective and an efficient solution. Um, the, the adage is if the only tool you have is a hammer, every problem looks like a nail. Army has a very big hammer, and they like to use their hammer. But sometimes, especially in insurgencies, hammers are not the best tool. So part of what I did was let's think about these, these individuals in different, uh, in different um context. So do we need to kill person X? Well, how bad are they? So my job was was largely to say, okay, yeah, that guy's bad. He's got to go. This guy has potential. Let's try to engage this person. Let's try to work within the civil society. Let's try to at least uh, tacitly get him to join our, uh, whatever our sociopolitical goals were in this, in this uh, small area. So it was, it was working with the intelligence uh, community to try and bring in a different perspective. Okay, thank you. Uh, there's a couple of other questions. Let me see if I can kind of combine this. Uh, a couple of students want to know about ISIS's claims to tragic events. For example, uh, well, there was some association, they're still trying to figure that out with the recent attack in New York, but there was also the Paris attack and other things. Uh, like that. So maybe you could talk a little bit about some of the more high profile attacks in the West that ISIS is doing. And another one wants to know about where they get their money from and how they how they fund this and how they're able to, uh, how, I guess, they're probably thinking in the past how they were able to move uh, so fast. Yeah, I think those are all good questions. The uh, let's answer the first the first one first. Uh, the connection to these terrorist attacks in Western Europe and uh, you know most recently in the U.S. I think what's interesting about the Islamic State is we have this tremendous amount of internet um, an internet uh, presence for the Islamic State. People are radicalizing through the internet in these different countries and they're largely conducting lone wolf attacks. So they have a very loose uh, affiliation with the Islamic State. It's more as if they adopt this ideology and through maintaining a similar ideology they are part of the Islamic State. So I think it's a very decentralized organization which is just going to make it uh, extremely difficult to try and actually combat uh, these type of, uh, of lone wolf attacks. I think it's 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 just an individual associating themselves with this broader organization and then acting on those ideologies. Um, how, now, how, about, part, how about the funding? The funding. Uh, you know, we have another uh, uh, colleague that boy, I wish I wish he were here from from graduate school who works in counter terror finance. But my understanding is a lot of the, the funding comes from uh, a illegal oil well or uh, illegal well, I guess it, uh, oil, oil uh, revenues so they, they can take over pipelines they can uh, steal oil out of the pipelines that's part of it um, uh, a lot of kidnappings for ransom are funding or funding uh, terrorist organizations and. I don't know for certain, but I am sure there's a lot of wealthy Islamic extremists within many of the Gulf states um, that provide funding through a host of different mediums into these different organizations. I mean, Saudi Arabia consistently tries to, well, t they say they consistently try to crack down on uh, money leaving Saudi Arabia and going into different extremist groups, but, you know, it's just trying to put your finger in the dike of a bursting dam, I think. So there's there's plenty of money coming into these organizations. And if I'm not mistaken, you could correct me, but they had a system of taxation in the caliphate as well. And when they were taking over different areas uh, within Syria, and I know it, for a fact that like in Mosul, when they took over Mosul, the first thing that they did was took over the banks, and they got they estimated about a half a billion dollars in cash. So there's some strong armed robbery as well, right? Right. Yes, yeah, certainly. You know, you, you can go with the, the white collar route to cash or you can just start uh, uh, robbing banks. I mean, it's it's 
when you start to possess that much territory and you're able to control that territory, the I think the amount of resources one can can extract from that area is, is certainly not insignificant. I have I mean, another also, question. Sure. I have another, sorry to interrupt. I have another question from a student. Wants to know if you can explain the relationship between Russia, the U.S., ISIS, Syria, and all of that. I mean, it's a very uh, complicated issue, but could you give us the brief sort of overview of what's going on there? Yes, a uh, very complex question. I guess the first way that I would address it is we have to look at the role of uh, of, of Russia. Uh, I actually just had a very interesting speaker in one of my classes a couple days ago talking about the fact that uh, Russia seeks to destabilize uh, much of the world by destabilizing uh, much of the globe through this concept of hybrid warfare. So backing different insurgent groups, using uh, social media, the internet, etc. They're able to try and uh, de uh, de destabilize different, different regimes, including the United States. So by destabilize, I don't mean uh, you know, the collapse of the U.S. government. But what we see is a tremendous amount of gridlock and, and opposition and paranoia on the part of our legislatures where nothing gets done. And when nothing gets done, Russia wins. So they do have an interest in uh, uh, destabilizing the U.S. in that way. They also have close ties with the Iranian regime. You know, there's a... Uh, 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 a pretty tight alliance between the, these two states. And if we look at uh, the Iraq, excuse me, the, the Middle East in general, Iraq, excuse me, Iran is making a, a very strong push to become a, uh, a hegemon of that region. It's largely a balance between Iran and Saudi Arabia. And to, to an extent, the U.S. backs Saudi Arabia, Russia backs Iran, and it's uh, it's old school power politics, power balancing within the region at this time. Um, I wish we had more time to, to really delve into that question, but uh, that's 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 a there's a lot there's a lot there. Another question for you, Dr. Arsenal, if you would. A student named Nathaniel would like to know where they get their weapons. Oh, well, that's uh, one of the, the major ways that they got weapons was, A, it was that uh, 500,000 uh, Iraqi military members that we essentially put on the unemployment list. They left with weapons. They were uh, uh, A lot of them moved into that role of those Sunni, Sunni uh, insurgent groups. Um, when they became, when they came back into Iraq from Syria, they took tremendous amounts of weapons from the Iraqi government forces, which uh, which we had left there, and that was uh, that was certainly problematic. Um, what it's interesting to note is kind of an aside. We have our mine resistant vehicles, our MRAPs uh, that we left with the Iraqi government, and they're now being used as uh, massive suicide car bombs. So essentially, you can't stop these vehicles; they're packed with explosives. Uh, and they're just they're driven in and just blowing blowing blocks of you know city city apart. It's uh, it's tremendous. But bottom line, they're getting their weapons largely from the Iraqi government as they start to over overrun these different positions. That that's including uh, artillery, which they didn't have until they invaded Iraq. I, right. One of the things. One Go of ahead. the things. One of the things that was uh, sort of going around as a rumor when I was in Iraq is that when ISIS invaded Iraq and took over large areas of that, there was wide scale speculation among the Kurdish people that they were ordered to stand down on purpose. And the idea was that Ba'athist loyalists that we still had positions of power within the Iraqi government were to blame. What do you think about that? That the Iraqi forces were forced to stand down? On, that... on purpose, that's a, a sort of inside job, if you would. 
I think there's two there's two issues there. The the first is that the Iraqi military is dominated by Shia forces, and I think the Iraqi government feared putting Shia forces into traditionally held Sunni areas. Uh, there's a fear of um, sparking ethnic violence. So not only do you have to deal with the Islamic State, but now you have to deal with the, the disillusioned Ba'athists, those moderate uh, Sunni tribes that at one point in time fought the Islamic State. I think that was a fear of the Iraqi or the Iraqi government. And I think it parallels the fact that they, they really had no support for Kurdish forces as well. Uh, when the Kurdish forces are fighting the Islamic State, there was very little support from from, uh, from Baghdad in that case. It's kind of, I think, that concept of divide and conquer and coupled with the, the strong desire to maintain that Shia-dominated government. Okay, let's, uh, let's take one more question. This is actually from one of my students, Linda. She wants to know, um, well, first she, she says that ISIS has brought terrorism to a new extreme. I want to get your thoughts on that. And then also uh, she wants to know whether or not that this is uh, something that uh, will be resolved peacefully eventually or not. Uh, to answer the first part of the question, yes, the Islamic State has brought terrorism to a, a, a new new extreme. Part of it is we've seen a shift to what uh, many call new terrorism. So old terrorism generally stemmed from nationalist conflicts. There were surgical, uh, surgical strikes to target particular uh, symbols and what have you, um, you know, assassinations, hijackings and what have you. The new terrorism is ground by this sort of uh, supernatural sort of uh, motivation, right? It's a religious guided uh, motivation. We see mass casualty attacks. We see the desire to uh, just inflict m as many casualties as we possibly can. Uh, we also see this drastic increase in the use of technology, internet technology and what have you, uh, to radicalize people uh, thousands and thousands of miles away towards towards their cause. Um, you know, uh, the Islamic State is a brand. It's a brand and they're doing a hell of a job uh, marketing their brand to a lot of uh, uh, disillusion, uh, disillusioned people and get, getting them to, uh, to act on their behalf. Uh, will it end peacefully? I, I, I don't think so. I don't think so. Um, some people say we need to control the narrative, right? We need to be able to, to, to head off this radicalization and what have you. I don't see that being feasible. Um, perhaps, perhaps I'm jaded. Uh, I think, I think the only way to contain and uh, and I don't think we'll ever get rid of the, the Islamic State per se or radical Islam or what have you the only way to contain is continue with those targeted strikes counterterrorism efforts try to kill as many of the leadership as we can um, but even then I, I feel like it's uh, you're, we're, we're fighting an uphill battle well thank you very much dr. Arsenal for coming and sharing your expertise and wisdom with us today. We really appreciate that. For Thank you, and I apologize for the PowerPoint. I apologize for the PowerPoint uh, mishap. I, uh, we, we should have, I should have ran through that earlier. No, no, no worries. We're, we're happy to have you here. Um, just a, a note for all of you students, we've just posted a link to a survey. If you are attending, for extra credit, make sure that you fill out that survey. And even if you're not, we'd like to hear your thoughts and uh, let, let us know. This is the first time we've tried this, so we want to, you know, improve and see maybe what you'd like to see from this series in the future. Once again, thank you very much, Dr. Arsenal. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. I enjoyed it. Goodbye. Bye bye.